one Friday night when I was in high school, I was just hanging out with my best friend Maya at her house and planning to sleep over that night. We weren't in the mood to watch a movie and felt like doing something more adventurous. She suggested that we go onto this anonymous video chat site that she had heard about from one of her friends at school. It was called Omegle, and I had never heard about it before. She said you could type in your interests and get randomly connected with people all over the world and could talk face to face with them. I was a little skeptical. My parents definitely wouldn't allow me to use a site like this, but I guess they would have no way of finding out. Maya kept trying to convince me, telling me it would be a great way to meet some cute guys. Eventually, I gave in and agreed. We were both sitting on Maya's bed, her laptop propped up in front of us. She pulled up the site and we read the warning message that popped up before you enter the site. It said that you had to be 18 years old or older to use the site without a parent. Neither Maya or I were 18 yet, but she clicked the start chatting button anyways. We waited a moment while it connected us with someone. Finally, a girl's face popped up on the screen. She was around our age. She smiled and waved to us and we chatted with her for a few moments before moving on to the next person. It was a creepy looking older guy who looked especially eager to see us. I told Maya to click off and she did so before the man could get a word in. When we connected to the third person, both Maya and I gasped out loud. <gasps> it was a figure sitting in a dimly lit room. The figure was wearing a horrifying clown mask. The mask reminded me of Pennywise the Clown from the horror movie. Um, hello? Maya said hesitantly. Hello, girls, the figure said. It was a male's voice, but I had no idea what age he was. He was wearing a strange black cloak and matching gloves, so we had no idea what he looked like. The room he was in looked similar to that of a basement. There was no paint on the walls and I couldn't see any furniture in the background. It was a creepy vibe for sure. He proceeded to tell us he was so happy that we were there and it was a delight to meet us. We just stared at the screen, our eyes transfixed at the strange scene. The man asked us if we would like to see a magic trick. Maya and I both glanced at each other hesitantly. Uh, okay, I guess, Maya told him. Wonderful, he replied. He then stood up and moved just out of frame for a second. When he returned, he was carrying a silver case. He opened it up and pulled out a black top hat. He shook the top hat around to show us that it was empty. He then told us he would need our help with the trick. He told us that when he waved his hand over the hat to say the magic words, abracadabra, out loud. I thought the whole thing was weird, but desperately wanted to find out what this crazy person was going to do next. When he waved his hand over the hat, we both said the magic words as he had told us. He then reached into the once empty hat and pulled out a living white rabbit. Wow, I said, somewhat impressed. After holding the rabbit close to the camera so we could see, he put it back into the hat and told us to say the magic words again. We did and he waved his hand over the hat. He then turned the hat over and the rabbit disappeared again. Maya and I both looked at each other in amazement. He then began the next trick. The camera was moved to show a dartboard hanging on the other side of the room. The man held a dart in one hand, turned around so that his back was facing the board, and threw the dart. I gasped when I saw that he had made the bullseye. He retrieved the dart and then said he was going to make things a little more interesting. He reached back into the case and pulled out a long, jagged knife. Again, he turned around, his back facing the dartboard. He hurled the knife over his shoulder at a startling force and it slammed right into the board again, making a bullseye. And now for the finale. I'm going to need my assistant, he said loudly his voice creepier than ever. He stepped out of frame for just a few moments, and Maya and I looked at each other in confusion, not knowing what to expect next. I was surprised when I heard the word assistant, because the whole time we had been chatting with this man, we hadn't heard anyone else present. Suddenly, the man walked back into the view of the camera. I was shocked by what I saw next. He was pushing a woman in one of those office chairs with wheels on the bottom. She was tied to the chair with ropes, her hands and legs bound tightly. There was duct tape over her mouth and tears running down her face. Wait, what's going on? I said, my panic rising. Something was not right. This is my lovely assistant, the man said. The woman looked to be in her early 20s. 
She had blonde hair that was hanging in her face, and one of her eyes appeared swollen. She was thrashing around on the chair, clearly trying to get free. Maya and I watched in utter horror as the man pushed the woman's chair so that it was back against the wall where the dart board had been hanging. He then reached into his pocket and pulled out a big red marker. He took off the cape and drew a small circle on the woman's forehead. He then ripped the duct tape off of her mouth. She instantly began screaming for help. Her screams cut me to my core. The man ignored her screams and walked back to where the camera was. At first I was confused, not knowing what his plan was. But then suddenly Maya began screaming. She said that he had drawn a bullseye. As she said this, the man reached back into his case and pulled out an enormous knife. That was when it hit me what he was about to do next. I wish I had looked away, but I didn't. It was like my eyes were glued to the screen. I watched as the man turned his back to the girl, lifted the knife in the air, and hurled it right into her head. Her screams went silent, and the man let out a horrific laugh. Maya reached out and slammed the laptop closed. Maya was sobbing, but I sat there in silence, too stunned to process that we had just witnessed a murder. After she collected herself, she went and woke up her parents. After we explained to them what happened, they immediately called 911. We eventually had to go to the police station and describe in detail exactly what we saw. Maya had to turn over her laptop to the police so they could try to track the IP address. Months went by and they were eventually able to locate the suspect who was going by a different name all the way across the country. As it turned out, the woman that we saw that first day was not his first victim. Several bodies were located in an abandoned warehouse where he had been seen. He is now thankfully behind bars. During the beginning part of quarantine, I was home from school and super bored. We hadn't had in-person classes for weeks. I couldn't see my friends or really even leave the house except to go for a walk. I was sitting in my room trying to think of something fun to do when I suddenly remembered the video chat site Omegle. Back in middle school, I used to go on there all the time with my friends. I figured I would give it another try. After all, I didn't have anything else going on. I used the new feature where you can type in your interests in hopes of getting matched up with someone that you have things in common with. The interest I typed in was cooking, something I had been working on learning more about during the pandemic. I pressed enter and waited to be connected with someone. The first person I got paired up with was a girl my age. She was really sweet and we instantly hit it off. She told me about some cooking shows she really liked and mentioned that she thought I would probably enjoy them too. We were discussing different recipes when her mom called her to come down for dinner. We quickly exchanged phone numbers so we could chat more in the future and then got disconnected. I had enjoyed my first conversation so much that I decided to connect with another person. This time it was a guy. He was definitely older than I was by a decent amount, but he was also very cute. He greeted me, a smile on his face, and we began making small chat. He told me his name was Tony and that he was 19 years old. I was only 16 at the time, but I lied and said I was 18 years old so he would keep talking to me. He told me he was going to culinary school at a college in Chicago, which was only about 30 minutes from where I lived. I know I shouldn't have, but I got excited and told him what city I was from. We seemed to be really connecting and we talked on and off for over an hour. We ended up exchanging our Snapchats before disconnecting. The next day, Tony sent me a couple of Snapchats. They weren't of his face, they were just little snapshots of his day, like a latte he had gotten and a view from outside the window of a bus. I sent him a few Snapchats in return. We kept this up over the course of several weeks. Then one day I decided to ask him if he would want a video chat through the feature Snapchat has. He told me that he would like to do so and we set up a time that evening. When the time rolled around, I called him and he answered. Strangely, his camera was blurry and I couldn't make out anything. Hello, I said, but I didn't get an answer. While I was still connected, Tony messaged me saying that he had recently dropped his phone and he thought that it had properly damaged his camera and speaker. I told him that it was okay, we could just talk over chat instead, but he quickly told me no. He said that I could just talk as normal and he would answer through the chat, which I agreed to. The conversation started out normal with us just chatting about our day and how it had gone, but then after a few minutes, it took a very weird turn. He told me how beautiful I was and how much he wished he could be in person with me right now. I tried to steer the conversation back to cooking, but nothing worked. He began to get more and more graphic, describing things he wanted to do to me. 
He kept getting more and more uncomfortable. I didn't want to be talking about these things, and after all, I knew that it was wrong because I was a minor. I told him that I should really be going and that I had some homework to work on. He immediately got super intense and harsh with me. Don't you dare hang up on me, he wrote in the chat, and even told me that if I hung up, I was going to be really sorry. I started to get really scared, so I quickly disconnected and then blocked him on Snapchat so he could no longer communicate with me. I hadn't given him my phone number or even told him my last name, so I assumed that would be the end of it. He wouldn't have any way of finding me online. How wrong I was. The next day, I was home alone while my parents were at work. My dad is a police officer and my mom works as a nurse, so neither one of them had the opportunity to stay home when the pandemic hit. So most days I would be home by myself, sometimes till around dinner time. The days were pretty boring, with virtual school, TV, and daily walks with my dog. On this particular day, I was in the middle of Zoom school when I got a text from an unknown number. I opened up the message, and it was my full name in capital letters. Underneath it said, I told you you would regret blocking me. I immediately knew it was Tony. He must have found me somehow. I was scared, but didn't think I was in any immediate danger. After all, Tony had no way of knowing where I lived, and all my social media pages were private, so he wouldn't be able to find out any more personal information about me. I decided that the best thing to do was ignore him. I blocked the number again and tried my best to pay attention for the rest of the school day. When I was finally done with classes for the day, I decided to text my dad to see what time he would be home from work. It would usually just be he and I at dinner during the week since my mom worked late. He told me that he had gotten pulled into a high profile case and wasn't going to be home until midnight or later. He said for me to go ahead and have dinner without him. I was a little disappointed. After so many hours in the house alone, it was beginning to feel a little lonely. I didn't feel like cooking that night, so I put some pizza rolls in a pan and placed it in the oven. Right as I was doing so, my phone began ringing. I picked it up and noticed that it was another unknown number. Hesitantly, I answered it. Hello? I said softly. The voice on the other line was gruff and scary. If you don't answer my messages, you're going to be sorry the person said. Immediately I knew it was Tony, so I hung up the phone and blocked this new number. I was beginning to realize this was going to be a real problem. I could block him as much as I wanted, but he could still get a different number to call me from. I brushed it off as best I could and told me that he would get bored and go after someone else eventually. After having dinner, I cleaned up the kitchen and went up to my room to scroll through some TikToks. I was getting sleepy and about ready to change into my pajamas when all of a sudden there was a huge shattering noise that caused me to jump up with a gasp. I saw glass on the floor and quickly realized that someone had thrown a rock through my window, breaking it. The rock was large, definitely big enough to cause some damage if it hit me. I glanced at the rock closer and saw that it had a note attached to it. My fingers shaking, I picked it up and read it. Open your front door now, it read in big, bold letters. I had barely finished reading it when I heard a loud, aggressive pounding on the front door. Immediately, I thought of Tony. He had come for me. I rushed to my bedroom door and locked it. I then grabbed my phone and dialed 911. I told the dispatcher I was in danger and needed help right away. It took seven minutes for the police to arrive and the pounding continued until the police sirens were roaring outside. Tony tried to run, but luckily a neighbor watching the whole thing had seen which direction he went in and told the police. They caught up with him shortly after and he was arrested. It turned out that he had a long track record of becoming obsessed with women and harassing them. I'm very lucky that I got help before something worse happened. I was really shy growing up and had trouble meeting friends. One evening when I was bored, I decided to try out the popular chat site Omegle. I decided to use the text feature as opposed to video. I always found that when I was texting instead of talking in person, I was less awkward because I had more time to formulate a response or think of something witty. I ended up getting connected with a girl who was the same age as me. Her name was Erin and she lived in California, the exact opposite side of the country as me. We ended up totally hitting it off and having a great conversation. I loved hearing about what life was like in California, a place I had always dreamed of visiting. Similarly, she liked hearing about life in New York, where I lived. We ended up exchanging numbers and we began texting on a daily basis. 
We talked about everything from school to shows we liked and our different celebrity crushes. I had a few close friends, but this friendship was different. It felt like Aaron really cared when I told her about my day or ranted about different things I was passionate about. The strange thing was, I don't even know her last name. She would occasionally send me selfies though, so I felt like I knew who I was talking to. We talked nearly every day for a month. One day I decided to ask Erin if she would like to video chat. She said that her laptop camera was broken and that she was waiting to get it fixed. I brushed it off since this made sense at the time. Sometimes I would even send her a selfie or two just so she could have an idea of what I looked like. Every time I did, she would shower me in compliments and tell me how beautiful I was. No one else really said things like that to me, so it made me feel really good and definitely boosted my confidence. I always told her that she was way prettier than me, which she always denied. Months went by and we got closer and closer. I considered her my closest friend at the time. The more we got to know each other, the more comfortable I got sharing more personal details about my life with her. I told her that my mother had breast cancer and how hard it had been on the family. She was a great listener and gave me lots of support, which meant a lot to me. I also talked about a guy I liked at school and she encouraged me to go after him. One day, Erin told me that she had a secret she wanted to tell me. She said she was worried I would be mad when I found out. I was curious what she could mean, but assured her I would not be mad. She then told me that she had gotten her laptop camera fixed and wanted to tell me the secret over video chat. I was so excited to talk to her. I propped up my computer and gave her a call. When the camera connected, I was shocked by what I saw. I was face to face with a middle-aged man in a ripped white undershirt. At first I thought it was Aaron's dad or someone, but then he said, hello, I'm Aaron. It's nice to meet you. I gasped and my mouth dropped open. He then began to laugh like a madman at the top of his lungs. I slammed my laptop shut and burst into tears as I realized that I had been the victim of a sick joke. The person I thought I had known so well was nothing like they appeared to be. This experience crushed me and I never used Omegle again. Sleep tight.